Today's reading is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. The Gospel according to John is the fourth of four New Testament narratives recounting the life and death of Jesus Christ. The other three Gospels having been written by Matthew, Mark, and St. Luke. This is a bit of a tongue twister. I'll try to get through it. it <laughs> Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation of, for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of God for the people of God. One of the privileges of being a pastor is I often get to be a frontline responder to people in times of need, loss, and deep vulnerability. Most people know that I visit the hospital or sit with people who've lost a loved one. I pray with folks through a variety of life circumstances. But not everybody knows that depending on the timing of a need, I may also be the one who delivers a meal or helps pay a bill, or fill a gas tank, or get someone a clean, dry pair of shoes to wear. Ministry takes many shapes and sizes. It changes from day to day, and that's part of why I love it. I don't do the same thing every single day. It's always a little bit different. Back in October, as Sarah and Kevin Culp recovered from the kidney transplant surgery and had had their recovery time in Seattle extended, I made a quick trip over the mountains to see them. Many of you had given financially to support their continued needs, and others of you had brought gifts and cards and goodies to share. So I collected the check and the gifts and made the drive to Seattle, expecting to find them at their Airbnb. Only on the way over the mountains, Sarah let me know they were back at the hospital. It was a rocky road of recovery for several weeks, and Kevin needed yet another bag of IV fluids and another conversation with his doctor to try and resolve his persistent nausea. So I headed to Virginia Mason instead. I carried in a small gift bag of goodies, an affirmation of your persistent thoughts and prayers. I handed it to Sarah and I said, here is some love in concrete form. That phrase stuck with me. I hadn't planned those words. They were just what came in the moments. 
I imagine she could see a loaf of bread as a loaf of bread and some granola bars as a snack for later in the day and those cards as just paper and ink. But I saw something much more than that. I saw love in concrete form. People shared love. You shared love. It happened to be that much of that love tasted delicious and could fill a hungry tummy, but you shared love in concrete form, and I simply got to be the messenger. This week, one of my joys was to take the donations that we had received to date to the Ukrainian refugee family at their apartment. I had gift bags and grocery bags full of a variety of items, all from you. You gave them cleaning supplies and children's books, linens and hand soaps, winter gloves, toys for the kids, a spice rack, tools, and much more. And this week, I'll gather up the next batch of gifts to deliver. When I look at the bottles of cleaning supply and neatly folded towels, various household supplies and warm fuzzy blankets and socks, I see love. I don't see stuff. I see love. Your love poured out for a family of strangers that you may never meet. I've never had to flee my home, not because of an altercation or abuse, definitely not because of a war. I've always had a safe, warm place to lie my head at night. I can barely imagine the fear, the heartache, and the loss that this family and countless others have experienced because of the war in Ukraine. But I can imagine the gift of needed supplies and everyday items, of festive and fun mixing bowls and new soft towels to put away in a new apartment in a land far from home. I can imagine the relief of re receiving items you knew you needed but couldn't afford. I can imagine the joy of having an excess of necessities, not just enough toilet paper for this week, but for next week and the week after for your family of five. Not just one lamp, but two. Not just one towel per person, but enough that you could throw the towels in the wash and still go take a shower and dry yourself off while they're in the other room getting cleaned and dried. Many of those things are luxuries we take for granted. But imagine leaving your home with only what you can carry and starting your new life in a foreign place where you don't speak the language. Every item you have becomes precious, both for what you lost and left behind and for what you now have and can do because of the new ones in your midst. The gifts that we carry didn't come with receipts, so I don't know the actual costs. But I can imagine that what you've given tallies easily more than $700, maybe closer to a thousand. And all of that walked in their door in just a matter of minutes. Some of you shared an item that you owned and no longer needed, something that you had an excess of. Some went to dollar store, some went to Target, others to the grocery store. Dozens of you contributed, and together you gave the gift of love in concrete form. God's agape love. It was abundant and overwhelming. I'd hand them something, go back to the car to grab something else. Hold on, there's more. And something else and something else. It was abundant. It was selfless. It was altruistic and expects nothing in return. It's a special kind of love because it's given freely, no strings attached. It's given from a place of empathy and compassion. God's love is the same love that carries us through a different kind of loving, covenanted relationships, community that is built and lasts a lifetime. But here, in this way, it's nuanced. It moves blindly in the world, not hung up on qualifications or somebody's quirks, nor the resentments that we carry or the rejections that we faced. Love is simply shared. And your gifts to the refugee family weren't a one-off. Your gifts were placed at the foot of the tree where we've had tags for Columbia School to give to their children and families. 
This week, Jan Blasing delivered over 60 gift cards. That's little plastic miracles that produce food to put on your table, diapers for your baby, shoes on your feet, and jackets on your body. Love in concrete form. Your gifts regularly fill the little free pantry. Cereal and canned bean, boxes of milk, jars of peanut butter and jelly, pasta and sauce, all given out to strangers looking to fill their bellies or stretch their pantry just a little bit longer until payday. Love in concrete form. Last week, Pastor LaVon shared how your financial gifts to this church made it possible for us to give him $400 to buy socks and underwear for men and women who have very limited access to a safe and stable place to live. Love in concrete form. These gifts came from you, your compassion and your generosity. And as a Christian pastor, I can't help but think that your love flows because you were loved first. The passage from 1 John rings out the connection between God's love for us and our love for others. The two are interwoven in ways that can't be undone. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, that we might live through him. If we love one another, God abides in us, and God's love is perfected in us. We love because God first loved us. God loves us freely and abundantly. God chooses us. We see this love most clearly in the person of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. In Jesus, we see God push the boundaries of who is included and who is welcome at the table. In Jesus, we see God help people in the midst of great suffering and need. Through Jesus, people are fed, they are healed, they are reconnected with their community. They are forgiven, they are restored, they are redeemed. Because of Jesus, we see God's love in concrete form. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. We love because God first loved us. And when we share love, we share God. We share God's love because we have God's love. And we have God's love because God loves us. Now framed in this way, love is glorious. And it sounds so easy. But let's be real. Sometimes love is hard. Sometimes our reserves run low. Sometimes we don't feel very loving. We don't want to give any more. Sometimes we suffer compassion fatigue. Sometimes people wear on us. Sometimes we want them to care about changing their, their circumstances more than we care about changing their circumstances. Sometimes blindly loving a stranger is much easier than continuing to compassionately love a family member. Loving as God loves isn't always rainbows and sunshine. Sometimes loving people means wading through a self-created cesspool of suffering. And sometimes it's not quite that bad, but it's still hard. Harder than we want it to be, and arguably harder than it should be when we think of loving someone. People are complicated, and loving one another takes effort. When it's hard and undesirable, I would encourage you to pause and remember, I love because God first loved me. Now, I don't say that so that we feel it as an obligation. I say it so that we remember that our source is God. God fills us. So if you're low on reserves, ask God to fill your cup. Remember, God's love is abundant, unconditional, and free. Whenever you need more, you simply turn to God and say, I need more. We love because God first loved us. So we have to make sure we're poised and positioned to receive that love before we try and pour out and pour into others. Ask God to fill you first. 
The other suggestion I would offer for loving when it's hard is to focus on love in concrete form. Gary Chapman gave us a wonderful gift in his book, Five Love Languages. He describes five primary ways that we express our love to others. Physical affection, acts of service, words of affirmation, quality time, and gift giving. Each one is love in concrete form. A hug, washing the dishes, watching a movie together or going for a walk, simply talking with one another, giving a gift telling someone they are valued and precious and important. For someone who is hard to love, think about how you might show love, even if you don't feel the love. Remember, in the Greek, the language of the New Testament, love is always a verb. Whether it's agape or eros or storge or philos, it is always a verb, always an action word. Love is what we do. We can show love even if we don't feel love. At the beginning of our service, we prayed these words, asking God to grant us the courage to share God's love. Love for the unexpected challenge. Love for the vulnerable one. Love for the presence of God. Individually and collectively, living a life of God's agape means living for much more than ourselves. It means being a part of something that offers hope, wraps people in compassion, shares joy, and engenders peace. May we invite and allow God to fill us with love first. May we have the courage we need to share God's love freely. And may we be able to give the gift of love in concrete form this season. Amen. Amen.